the 1st of September, 1939. After a false accusation that the Poles attacked a German radio station, Nazi Germany launches a retaliatory campaign against Poland, triggering World War II. After defeating the Polish army, the Germans ruthlessly suppress the Poles, whom they consider to be racially inferior, and in the weeks following the German attack on Poland, German SS, police, and military units shoot thousands of Polish civilians, including many members of the Polish nobility, clergy, and intelligentsia. In the fall of 1941, Nazi Germany begins to implement a plan code named Operation Reinhardt to systematically murder almost two million Jews living in the German-administered territory of occupied Poland called the General Government. Three killing centers are established as part of this plan, Belzec, Treblinka, and Sobibor. One of the most fearful officers of Sobibor becomes Kurt Bollander. Heinz Kurt Bollander was born on the 21st of May, 1912, in Duisburg, then part of the German Empire, and was a blacksmith by profession. It was Germany's economic collapse during the Great Depression, beginning in 1929, that most contributed to the Nazi Party's success. The crisis resulted in widespread unemployment and poverty, and also led to an increase in crime. The resulting anger and fear left the Germans vulnerable to arguments from both the extreme right and left. One such German was Kurt Bollander, who joined the Nazi party in 1930. Three years later, on the 30th of January 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany by President Paul von Hindenburg. Following his appointment as Chancellor, Hitler began laying the foundations of the Nazi state. In the first two years of his chancellorship, political parties, state governments, and culture and professional organizations were brought in line with Nazi goals. Culture, the economy, education and law all came under Nazi control. German authorities began eliminating Jews from governmental agencies and state positions in the economy, law, and cultural life. The Nazi government abolished trade unions and workers, employees, and employers were forced into the Nazi-controlled national labor organization named the German Labor Front. The Reichstag, the German parliament, transferred legislative power to Hitler's cabinet and thus lost its reason to exist. By mid-July, the Nazi party was the only political party left in Germany. In 1939, Bollander joined the SS Totenkopfverbände, or Death's Head Units. The Death's Head Units were an independent unit within the SS, responsible for administering the Nazi concentration and extermination camps throughout Germany and later occupied Europe. The units were trained to conduct themselves with strict discipline and cruelty, and to view the prisoners under their guard as enemies of the state, who should be destroyed if possible. They were responsible for facilitating what the Nazis called the Final Solution, known since the war as the Holocaust, which was the genocide of Jews in Europe. In 1938, Hitler announced that they were to become military units. Some groups were then discharged from guarding the camps for combat duty, serving in Poland and the Soviet Union. As the units were trained to be barbaric in their treatment of the camp prisoners, so too did they act on the field of combat. Death's Head units were known to be cruel and ferocious warriors, while at the beginning of World War II, they had 24,000 members, including reservists. By January 1945, that number had increased to 40,000. After the Second World War began, on the 1st of September 1939, Bollander started to work for the Nazi euthanasia program, codenamed T4, which was the systematic murder of institutionalized patients with disabilities in Germany. The patients were transported by bus or by rail into six killing centers, where they were murdered. In these centers, the Nazis gassed, shot, or killed by lethal injections those who were deemed unworthy of life, such as residents of welfare institutions, some concentration camp inmates, the chronically sick, the mentally and physically disabled, homosexuals, and even sick German soldiers. Bollander worked at Hartheim, Hadamar, Brandenburg, and Sonnenstein killing centers, and his duties included cremating the bodies of murdered victims, as well as testing gassing procedures during the T4 program. The T4 program predated the genocide of the European Jewry, the Holocaust, by approximately two years. Historians estimate that the program claimed the lives of 250,000 men, women, and children. In the fall of 1941, Nazi Germany implemented a plan to systematically murder the two million Jews living in German-occupied Poland. This plan was codenamed Operation Reinhardt, and as part of this action, three killing centers were established, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Because of his experience in the T4 program, in April 1942, 
He was sent to the Sobibor Killing Center, where he personally supervised gassings and cremations. German SS and police officials conducted deportations to Sobibor between May 1942, when the regular gassing operations began, and the fall of 1943. Most of the Jews brought to Sobibor were immediately gassed by carbon monoxide, which had been piped into the gas chambers from an engine. About 250,000 victims were murdered in this killing center. The Germans constructed Sobibor as a rectangle, 1,312 by 1,969 feet. A double barbed wire fence, woven with tree branches, surrounded the perimeter of the camp. This design was intended to hide the view of what was inside. It had two side-by-side -side gates, one for trains and another for foot traffic and vehicles. The Nazis paid special attention to the front compound, which consisted of living quarters and recreational buildings for the camp personnel. The SS officers lived in cottages with colorful names, which helped to conceal the purpose of the camp from the new arrivals, who would arrive on the adjacent ramp. When the transport of 40 to 60 freight cars arrived in the Sobibor railway station, only 20 cars at a time were taken into the camp, while the rest of the victims remained locked in the rail cars. The victims were brought into the so-called arrival area, where an SS man gave a speech welcoming them, saying that they had reached a transit camp on their way to a labor camp. They were also told that before embarking on the next part of their journey, they were to take showers, have their clothing disinfected, and get a meal. The men and women were separated, and the children were sent with the women. The Nazis ordered the victims to remove their clothing and hand over their valuables. The Jews were then marched on the run to the gas chambers. The honking of geese would obscure the cries of victims from those still sitting in the locked rail cars as they were being beaten, screamed at, and having warning shots fired at them. About 450 to 550 Jews were forced into the chambers at a time. The gas chambers were then sealed once the maximum number of victims was inside. Poisonous gas was then piped in. Within 20 to 30 minutes, all those inside were dead. Those who were too ill, weak, or elderly to make the walk to the gas chambers were shot in an open pit. The SS personnel working at Sobibor enjoyed a number of privileges, such as higher pay and regular visits home. Every three months, they could visit their families for two weeks. The SS also stole possessions of the victims such as gold, food, hair, and other valuables. The guards would even take toys from murdered children back home to their families. Kurt Bolander was no exception, and during his time at Sobibor, he managed to amass an immense personal fortune. Whenever he came home on holiday leave, he would bring a lot of gold teeth, as well as the dental bridge work of the murdered Jews. Whilst at Sobibor, Bolander was one of the most feared SS officers. On one occasion, there was a working Jew whom Bolander ordered to box with another working Jew, and for his pleasure, they hit each other almost to death. Another way of terrorizing the prisoners, apart from the bullying and beating, were the SS men's dogs. Bolander had a dog named Barry, a Saint Bernard dog, which was particularly dangerous and aggressive. The dog would walk quietly by his side, but when his master turned to one of the people and asked, So you don't want to work? Barry would launch himself at the person, biting the flesh, tearing at it, and pulling off chunks of it. Bolander also personally supervised gassings and cremations. He especially enjoyed observing how dozens of the Jewish women are forced to undress in an open place close to the gas chamber, and are driven into the gas chamber by SS members and the Ukrainian auxiliaries. When the women were shut up in the gas chamber, Bolander set the motor in motion. Several minutes later, the Jewish women were dead. In order to have more comfortable working conditions at Sobibor, Kurt Bolander had a wooden hut built on the edge of the crematorium pit. From there, he would watch the cremations and have a good time by, for example, roasting potatoes over the flames coming out of the pit. At Sobibor, Kurt Bolander had an athletic body and long hair, used to go walking half-naked, dressed solely in workout pants, carrying a long whip, with which he brutally lashed the camp prisoners whom he came upon on his way. On his way to lunch, he was in the habit of passing the main gate and swinging a whip with all his strength upon the heads of the Jews who went through. On one occasion, a group of prisoners was accused of carelessness because they had left a window open on one of the train cars. Each one of them was punished with 100 lashes, and Bolander was one of the most active guards performing the punishment. On several occasions, he would throw babies, children, and the sick straight from the freight cars into the trolley with a load that went to the execution pits disguised as a field hospital. Kurt Bolander was also a sexual deviant. SS officer Erich Bauer 
who worked at Sobibor together with Bolander, testified that Bolander and others had been involved in sexual orgies with Jewish women. According to his testimony on one occasion, Bolander, with other SS men, would visit Ruth and Gisela, two women from Austria who were film and theatre actresses in a Forrester house, gang rape them, and then have them shot. Bauer did complain about this, but not because he was sorry for the women. The reason for Bauer's complaints was that when he lived in the Forrester house in the room above, he was not able to fall asleep after coming back from a long journey due to the noisy sex parties that were conducted there. In December 1942, Bollander's duties at Sobibor were temporarily put on hold when he was sent to prison for intimidating a witness involved in his divorce. After serving the sentence, he returned to Sobibor, where he assisted in the dismantlement and liquidation of the camp, following the armed uprising in Sobibor on the 14th of October 1943. Afterwards, he served at the SS labor camp at Dorohucha, which was located in German-occupied Poland, and subsequently was transferred to Trieste in Italy. On the 18th of January 1945, Bollander was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. After World War II, Bollander assumed a fake identity, did not contact his family or relatives, and went into hiding under the false name Heinz Brenner. His fiancée, a former T4 employee, with whom he lived near Hamburg from November 1945, had him officially declared dead as Kurt Bollander. However, if he had hoped that he would escape justice, he was wrong. In May 1961, he was recognized working as a bouncer at a nightclub in Germany and was immediately arrested. At his residence, police found a whip with silver initials KB, the inscription that was created at the camp by Sobibor survivor Stanislaw Schmeisner. In 1965, Bollander, along with 11 former SS guards from Sobibor, was tried in Hagen, West Germany. Bollander was charged with aiding and abetting the joint murder of at least 86,000 people and murder in at least 360 cases. At the trial, Bollander initially claimed that he had never been in Sobibor, but instead fought against partisans around Lublin in Poland. However, he broke down under cross-examination and confessed to being present at Sobibor. Kurt Bollander was 54 years old when he died on the 10th of October 1966 from suicide by hanging in his prison cell in Hagen prior to the completion of the trial. In his suicide note, he insisted that he was innocent. There were no tears shed for Kurt Bollander. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.